the extent to which the Palestinians can adapt to climate change is heavily constrained by the situation of the occupation. The lack of access to the Palestinians to their to their water is, is, is as a result of the occupation is the most significant kind of impact on, on their kind of water situation. The Israelis basically control over 80% of the water from the West Bank aquifers and the rest of the water they, they, have, they have a say in. Yeah? It means that the Palestinians are not able to uh, uh, create a water governance system. The occupation involves control of water supply in the same way that an occupation controls all other, you know, many other aspects of, of everyday, everyday life, like so employment opportunities, mobility, uh, educational opportunities. The control of water is a um, aspect of the fundamental kind of uh, control of land, control of territory. Uh, and the occupation of the of the Palestinian territory involves, therefore, the control of the resources within that territory. The, the easy kind of uh, narrative about the Palestinians can't govern themselves, which is almost farcical to me in terms of the situation that they're in. The Israelis will say, well, we have the Oslo Accord, says uh, there's arrangements for water sharing, we give the Palestinians more water, or we will sell them water. The irony of the Palestinians being sold their own water, which is a sort of astonishing in its kind of sort of uh, a brazen kind of uh, uh, idea that we're doing them a favor by taking their water and selling it back to them. The settlements within the West Bank, East Jerusalem, they take four or five times the water of um, Palestinian villages and towns. One of the things that the Israelis do is when international organizations come in and, and, and want to invest in improving a Palestinian water infrastructure, the, the Israelis insist where relevant that these water infrastructure projects are integrated into the settlement water infrastructure. This puts international organizations often in a big dilemma as well, we, you know, we shouldn't be supporting settlements because they're illegal under international law, but if we don't, then this Palestinian village won't get its water. I mean, I've been in the West Bank where you see this really stark contrast between between going uh, past a Palestinian village where they're really struggling to get water. Then you go very, very closely, come to a settlement and they have swimming pools. And it just looks so uh, surreal. And I don't know how the, uh, the settlers themselves can kind of uh, um, exist in, that, in any sort of sense of, of, of comfort, knowing that there's that kind of uh, uh, astonishing inequality of, of access to water where one the palestinians are often struggling to, to get enough drinking water water company mecca which decides you know water which goes where i think they reduce the water available to uh, jerusalem and ramallah to increase water to settlements in the in east jerusalem for example so it's quite convenient for the international community and also for some ngos to talk about well, climate change, this is somewhere where, you know, surely the Palestinians, Israelis can come together and agree on a shared project because they both, they both kind of experience climate change. So why can't they come together to agree on climate change issues? Well, if you are under occupation, it's, it's not really a, 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 a discourse between equals. Occupation is not democratic. Israel uh, is, is bound by, although ignores, a whole series of provisions of international humanitarian law about protecting the resources, the, the natural resources of the population under occupation, which obliges them actually to protect the water resources and to ensure that Palestinians have access to sufficient water resources, even as an occupier. Even as an occupier, there are certain obligations that you have to do, which they're not doing. By the end of the century, we're, we're, we're looking at a kind of perhaps 30, in perhaps even 40% reduction of precipitation in, in, in Palestine for the, in terms of uh, water. And given that in, in the West Bank, that the agriculture is rain fed dependent, most of it, 85% is rain fed dependent, then that's potentially a major stress on agricultural systems, which depend on, on rainfall. And people are almost, well, not almost, they are forced to, into a situation where they're where they that they're having to use uh, local solutions like small uh, reverse osmosis equipment to clean water to, to to drink and to wash with and so forth. 
how can you create sustainable solutions to water management if you don't have access to your water? How can you create sustainable solutions to uh, a sort of agriculture if you're unable to sell your products in the next town? How are you able to scale up into a, 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 a kind of climate smart, low carbon economy if the uh, if your young people are unable to, 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 to leave Gaza or the West Bank you know, um, to get educated somewhere else. You've got to kind of give credit to Palestinians just for existing, you know, just for surviving. It's a survival culture at the moment. It's a survival culture in Gaza. It's a survival culture in the West Bank. And to expect anybody in a survival culture to, to have to do more is, is almost the wrong question.